Rutherford B. Hayes, 19th President of the United States, was the fifth child born to Rutherford and Sophia Burchard Hayes. He was born October 4, 1822, at Delaware, Ohio, about two months after the death of his father. His parents had come to Ohio in 1817 from Dummerston, Vermont. Young Rutherford and sister Fanny Arabella were raised by their mother and her younger bachelor brother Sardis Burchard. He was a successful businessman in Lower Sandusky, later Fremont, Ohio. Hayes attended school in Delaware and Norwalk, Ohio, and Middletown, Connecticut. In 1842, Hayes graduated from Kenyon College, Gambier, Ohio, valedictorian of his class. After a year of study in a Columbus law office, he entered Harvard Law School and received his degree in 1845. He began his law practice in Lower Sandusky. Not finding many opportunities there, he left in 1849 for Cincinnati, where he became a successful lawyer. His opposition to slavery drew him into the Republican Party. In 1852, Rutherford married Lucy Ware Webb of Chillicothe, Ohio. She was the youngest daughter of Dr. James and Maria Cook Webb and a graduate of Cincinnati's Wesleyan Women's College. She was the first wife of a president to graduate from college. They became the parents of eight children. When the Civil War began, Hayes offered his services to the state of Ohio. Governor William Dennison appointed him to the rank of major in the 23rd Ohio Volunteer Infantry. He saw much active service, rising to the rank of major general. He was severely wounded on September 14, 1862, at the Battle of South Mountain. In 1864, while still in the army, he was elected to Congress, despite his refusal to campaign. Hayes did not take his seat until the Union had won the war. He was re-elected in 1866. The following year Ohio voters elected him governor. He retired at the close of his second term in 1872, and moved to Fremont in May 1873. After winning a third term in 1875, the Republican Party chose Hayes as its presidential candidate. He won the 1876 election only after the creation of a special commission to decide disputed electoral votes. Because of the tension surrounding his election, Hayes secretly took the oath of office on Saturday, March 3, 1877, in the Red Room of the White House. President Hayes worked tirelessly to solve the country's problems. By 1877, it was clear that the nation's voters were no longer willing to use the army to protect the civil rights of the freedmen. Because a hostile Congress refused to provide adequate funds, Hayes reassigned the few remaining troops guarding two southern state houses. Before doing so, however, he extracted promises from southern leaders that they would protect southern African Americans in their political, economic, and civil rights. He hoped his actions would heal the wounds left by the Civil War. His sound money policies helped make business and industry stronger. He initiated civil service reform, aimed at ending patronage, and appointed men with sound qualifications to government positions. He also signed a bill that, for the first time, allowed women attorneys to appear before the U.S. Supreme Court. The president continued to be concerned with minorities, the poor, and immigrants. He believed that education and manual training would help all people achieve better lives. Hayes' honesty and fairness renewed respect for the presidential office. Honoring his commitment not to accept a second term, Hayes retired to his beautiful estate, Spiegel Grove, in Fremont, Ohio. Here, Hayes continued to give his time helping veterans to receive their pensions, improving conditions in prisons, and promoting universal education. He died at Spiegel Grove on January 17, 1893, at the age of 70. As the 19th President of the United States, 1877-1881, Rutherford B. Hayes oversaw the end of Reconstruction, began the efforts that led to civil service reform, and attempted to reconcile the divisions left over from the Civil War. Beneficiary of the most fiercely disputed election in American history, Rutherford B. Hayes brought to the executive mansion dignity, honesty, and moderate reform. To the delight of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, 
Lucy Webb Hayes carried out her husband's orders to banish wines and liquors from the White House. Born in Ohio in 1822, Hayes was educated at Kenyon College and Harvard Law School. After five years of law practice in Lower Sandusky, he moved to Cincinnati, where he flourished as a young Whig lawyer. He fought in the Civil War, was wounded in action, and rose to the rank of Brevet Major General. While he was still in the Army, Cincinnati Republicans ran him for the House of Representatives. He accepted the nomination, but would not campaign, explaining, an officer fit for duty who at this crisis would abandon his post to elect Tyone Er, ought to be scalped. Elected by a heavy majority, Hayes entered Congress in December 1865, troubled by the rebel influences, ruling the White House. Between 1867 and 1876 he served three terms as governor of Ohio. Safe liberalism, party loyalty and a good war record made Hayes an acceptable Republican candidate in 1876. He opposed Governor Samuel J. Tilden of New York. Although a galaxy of famous Republican speakers, and even Mark Twain, stumped for Hayes, he expected the Democrats to win. When the first return seemed to confirm this, Hayes went to bed, believing he had lost. But in New York, Republican National Chairman Zachariah Chandler, aware of a loophole, wired leaders to stand firm, Hayes has 185 votes and is elected. The popular vote apparently was 4,300,000 for Tilden to 4,036,000 for Hayes. Hayes's election depended upon contested electoral votes in Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida. If all the disputed electoral votes went to Hayes, he would win, a single one would elect Tilden. Months of uncertainty followed. In January 1877 Congress established an electoral commission to decide the dispute. The commission, made up of eight Republicans and seven Democrats, determined all the contests in favor of Hayes by 8 to 7. The final electoral vote, 185 to 184. Northern Republicans had been promising Southern Democrats at least one cabinet post, federal patronage, subsidies for internal improvements, and withdrawal of troops from Louisiana and South Carolina. Hayes insisted that his appointments must be made on merit, not political considerations. For his cabinet he chose men of high caliber, but outraged many Republicans because one member was an ex-Confederate and another had bolted the party as a liberal Republican in 1872. Hayes pledged protection of the rights of Negroes in the South, but at the same time advocated the restoration of wise, honest, and peaceful local self-government. This meant the withdrawal of troops. Hayes hoped such conciliatory policies would lead to the building of a new Republican Party in the South, to which white businessmen and conservatives would rally. Many of the leaders of the New South did indeed favor Republican economic policies and approved of Hayes' financial conservatism, but they faced annihilation at the polls if they were to join the party of Reconstruction. Hayes and his Republican successors were persistent in their efforts but could not win over the solid South. Hayes had announced in advance that he would serve only one term, and retired to Spiegel Grove, his home in Fremont, Ohio, in 1881. He died in 1893. He was a member of the United States House of Representatives and then Governor of Ohio for a long time before becoming the 19th President of the United States in 1877. Hayes was born an orphan into a middle-class family. After graduating from Kenyon College, he broke off his apprenticeship as a lawyer to study law at Harvard University. In 1845 he was admitted to the bar and opened a practice in Marietta, which he moved to Cincinnati a few years later. In 1852 he married Lucy Ware Webb, a staunch abolitionist. After beginning his political career in the Whig Party, he switched to the Republicans in the mid-1850s and supported Abraham Lincoln in the 1860 presidential election. During the American Civil War, he served in the Union Army and rose to the rank of Major General. One of his officers in the 23rd Ohio Infantry Regiment was the future President William McKinley. After two years as a member of the House of Representatives, he became Governor of the State of Ohio in January 1868. With a three-year break, 
he held this office until his inauguration as president. In 1876, the Republican National Convention nominated him as their candidate for the 1876 presidential election. Hayes won the majority of the electoral votes, but his opponent Samuel J. Tilden won the majority of the popular votes. It was the first election result of such a dispute in the history of the United States. Congress set up a commission to clarify the final result. The key question was to what extent African Americans in the southern states had been prevented from voting. The conflict was resolved by the Compromise of 1877, which is still controversial today, but parts of the opposition accused Hayes of a lack of legitimacy until the end of his presidency. The Compromise saw the Democratic Party recognize Hayes' presidency, but the Republicans made concessions to the Democratic-dominated Solid South. As a result, the military occupation of the last southern states and with it the post-Civil War Reconstruction policy were ended. This paved the way for the Jim Crow laws, which undermined the 14th and 15th Amendments, established racial segregation, and subsequently denied blacks full civil rights for almost a century. When the Great Railroad Strike of 1877 turned violent, Hayes sent the United States Army to restore order. He initiated an administrative reform to break the power of the party machine over the state authorities, thereby making enemies of influential Republicans, especially in New York. In foreign policy, he settled a border dispute between Argentina and Paraguay, which had flared up again a few years after the Triple Alliance War. He did not seek a second term and after his presidency retired to his residence Spiegel Grove, which is now located on the grounds of the Rutherford B. Hayes Presidential Center. In 1890 he took a trip to Bermuda with his daughter Fanny, which provided him with welcome distraction. Hayes, who was now occasionally a victim of dizzy spells, suffered a heart attack on the way back from Cleveland in early 1893. He reached Spiegel Grove, where he died in his bed a short time later on January 17. The public funeral four days later was attended by President-elect Cleveland, ministers from Benjamin Harrison's cabinet and Governor McKinley. He was buried next to his wife in Oakwood Cemetery. In many ways, Hayes was prouder of his military achievements in the Civil War than of his political achievements as president. It was no coincidence that Ari Hujanbaum titled his Hayes biography Warrior and President. Hayes was a dedicated family man who felt most comfortable with his loved ones. He always considered his marriage to Lucy to be the happiest event in his life. He was also loyal to friends and got some of them jobs in the civil service. Although he was not a member of a religious denomination, he attended church services every Sunday and was a devout Christian. He financed the construction of a Methodist church in Fremont and its reconstruction when it burned down in 1888. He had no prejudices on religious issues and also spoke before meetings of the Roman Catholic congregation. Unlike many of his compatriots, he was free of anti-Semitism, which was particularly virulent at the time. Although he was a supporter of the temperance movement, he rejected the introduction of prohibition. He believed that the population should be converted to abstinence through education, religion, and personal role models. Hayes was an intellectual who was interested in philosophical questions. He was well read and knew the works of William Shakespeare, Mark Twain, Leo Tolstoy, George Gordon Byron and many others. The books of Emerson had the greatest influence on him. His attitude to life was generally optimistic and open-minded. He bore no personal grudges against former Confederates. Even in his youth, Hayes showed a strong self-confidence, which he maintained as a lawyer, officer, and politician. As president, Hayes is remembered above all for the fact that he finally ended Reconstruction without calming the social and political tensions between North and South. According to Scorzetz, it is positive that after the crisis-ridden presidencies of Johnson and Grant, more calm returned to the White House and a phase of economic recovery began. Because he had to govern against a democratically controlled Congress, Hayes consolidated the powers of the president, thereby laying the foundation for later restructuring of the American political system. In the historical expert rankings of all presidents, he occupies a middle place. 
Scorzet sees Hayes's main achievement in his ability to combine traditional and modern values and to raise public awareness of them. According to Hugenboom, Hayes strengthened the office of the president, whose importance had declined in the previous decades due to the influence of the Whig ideology, which saw Congress as the real center of power. Although he consulted with his cabinet on all possible issues, in the end he made the decisions himself, even against recalcitrant department heads. Unlike Lincoln, he did not follow Congress in filling public offices and did not give his ministers a free hand in their areas of responsibility. In his fight with the capital against its patronage of offices and for federal support of education, he had John Quincy Adams as a model and was ultimately more successful than him. Hayes managed to set political guidelines himself and not just react to Congress in this regard. His administration therefore represents a step towards the modern president. This also includes the fact that, as happened in the conflict over the allocation of federal funds, he used his legislative power in the form of the right of veto, especially when he knew that public opinion was behind him. In this context, in anticipation of Theodore Roosevelt, he used his office as a speaker's platform and traveled more during his term than any of his predecessors. His social commitment as a former president was only matched by Jimmy Carter. Hujinbum also argues that hardly any president suffered a greater loss of reputation among later historians than Hayes. While most of his contemporaries viewed his administration positively, even earlier sharp critics such as Henry Adams, historians painted a negative picture of this presidency, especially in the second half of the 20th century. Authors such as Eric Foner, 1988, and William Gillette, 1979, as well as Webb Dubois, 1935, particularly criticized the Hayes administration's southern policy and its concessions to whites, neglecting the fact that after the crisis of 1873, economic issues were more important for citizens and that public opinion and a majority in Congress were against a continuation of the military occupation. According to Hugenboom, because from a modern perspective the values of the Gilded Age, which included laissez-faire liberalism and a paternalistic understanding of reform, are negatively connoted, historians in the late 20th century often lacked understanding of Hayes' decisions. For example, his Indian policy was criticized because it aimed to integrate the indigenous people into society and adapt their way of life. On the other hand, he followed the spirit of the times and also stopped the deportation of previous presidents. The Compromise of 1877 is still controversial today. Some historians point to Tilden's clear victory in the popular vote, others point to the lack of fairness of the elections in the southern states. The suppression of African American voters prevented Hayes from being elected not only in Florida, Louisiana and South Carolina, but probably also in Mississippi. In this context, historian Trefus points to the striking parallels to the controversial election results of the 2000 presidential election. In both cases, the loser in the popular vote became president and the vote count in Florida played a decisive role. Both Tilden and Al Gore disappeared from the political stage after their defeat. One difference is that the Democrats accepted the presidency of George W. Bush after the Supreme Court decision, but always questioned the legitimacy of Hayes. Most of his biographers emphasize that Hayes united the country, but failed to secure full civil rights for African Americans in the southern states. This did not happen, however, because he was indifferent to their fate, as his social commitment as ex-president makes clear. According to Trefus, Hayes was one of the most educated presidents in American history, whose greatest achievement was restoring the prestige of the White House after the scandal-ridden and corruption-ridden Grant administration. In doing so, he paved the way for the Republican success in the 1880 congressional and presidential elections. His activities after his term in office marked him as an early progressive. According to Trefus, his moderating skills enabled him to mediate not only between northern and southern states, but also between the factions of his party and in Congress. In political issues such as Chinese immigration and relations with Mexico, he was able to take and enforce moderate positions despite resistance. Overall, with this type of political leadership, 
he made most of his contemporaries forget the dubious circumstances of his election. According to historian Frank P. Vazano, Hayes left the Republicans, who had been divided between Blaine's half-breeds and Conkling's stalwarts, more united than he had found them when he took office. However, party strife broke out again after the assassination of Garfield in September 1881. In May 1916, the Rutherford B. Hayes Presidential Center was completed in Fremont with the inauguration of the library, whose books Hayes' son Webb C. had inherited and made available to the public. In addition to the Presidential Library, the area also houses the former Hayes residence, Spiegel Grove. This has had National Historic Landmark status since January 1964. Hayes County in Nebraska is named after this president, as are the Hayes Townships in Otsego, Michigan, and Swift County, Minnesota. Thomas Harry Williams, Ed Hayes, The Diary of a President, 1875-1881. David McKay, New York 1964. Charles Richard Williams, Ed Diary and Letters of Rutherford B. Hayes. New edition of the five-volume complete works from 1922 to 1926. Krauss Reprint, New York 1971. Thank you for watching this video.